Hi, and welcome to Storytelling Animals, a green new podcast of climate, ecology, and animal justice. I'm your host, Dayton Martindale, and today my guest is Rebecca Willis, the author of Too Hot to Handle, The Democratic Challenge of Climate Change. So, the summer between my sophomore and junior years of college, I was a, an astrophysical sciences major, and I was in the astrophysics office on a Friday afternoon where they have a tradition of, of five o'clock sherry, and a, I won't name him, but a, a very well-known and respected astronomer asked me uh, which of the following two types of governments I would prefer in an ideal world. Uh, the first being democracy, the other being ruled by a well-intentioned expert class of be they scientists or philosophers, but just a handful of people who both knew their stuff and really genuinely were trying to help. I raised the idea that such an expert class might be vulnerable to corruption or greed, and he said yes, but I mean in an ideal world, which would be better? I'm somewhat ashamed to say that I went for the expert class over democracy. Um, I have since uh, come through fairly significant change in my politics. Um, but this astronomy professor's idea of wouldn't it be better if just some well-intentioned experts set the policy instead of having to rely on what the people want and all our inconsistencies and short-sightedness this idea hasn't gone away. Earlier this year, when President Joe Biden nominated Sarah Bloom Raskin for a top post at the Federal Reserve, she came under fire from Republicans because she believes that uh, bank regulators should um, incorporate the financial risks posed by climate change into their uh, actions. In mid-March, uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin withdrew from her uh, nomination to this post because uh, Joe Manchin, the Democratic senator from West Virginia, who is famously bad on climate issues, um, voiced that he would oppose her. Upon Raskin's withdrawal, uh, Robinson Meyer, who is a climate journalist for The Atlantic, who does a lot of good work, tweeted to the effect that perhaps the climate movement should not have created an environment, quote, where qualified, experienced Democratic officials are incentivized to take aggressive public stands on climate, um, he suggested is not the best way to accomplish their policy goals. Uh, the implications seem to be that Raskin should not have so publicly come out to say that she cared about climate change and its financial risks. Uh, but that instead, perhaps working behind closed doors would be a better approach. To be clear, he did not see this say this outright. I replied, asking for this clarification, and while he did not reply to me, a number of people did, saying, yes, uh, Democrats shouldn't tell the people what their goals are on climate. We should just kind of try to ram it through, because the people can't be trusted. The next day, the blogger Matthew Iglesias published something to a similar effect that the climate movement is pursuing poor strategy by trying to push democratic leaders to embrace radical ideas like the Green New Deal, and that actually democratic leaders are doing good enough and pushing them to embrace stronger policies is just going to alienate people. Uh, central to his argument is a survey that purports to show that um, quote-unquote elites within uh, Democratic and even Republican parties and among independents, um, this is, you know, bureaucrats, think tankers, political staffers, scientists, lawyers, that these tend to have um, more progressive views on climate change than the general public. Uh, and so maybe we should be just letting elites uh, write our climate policy and not trying to put these debates uh, forward before the public. For a variety of reasons, I think this view is 
dangerous. And that's a lot of what we discuss in today's episode. While we don't talk about either my college conversation with a tipsy astronomer or the confirmation of Sarah Bloom Raskin to the Federal Reserve, or the failed confirmation, I should say, we do address these general issues. She argues forcefully and compellingly in her book, Too Hot to Handle, that the problem with climate change is that we don't have enough democracy, not that we have too much. In fact, when people are given opportunities to engage in what's called deliberative democracy, when they're put in a room and given presentations by experts, when they're allowed to ask questions, discuss among themselves, they end up coming up with policy proposals that are often more ambitious than what politicians would have been willing to do on their own. Plus, there are other reasons to worry about trying to dramatically transform the economy under the radar that we get into in the interview as well. So I hope you enjoy. As always, uh, please consider sharing with a friend, sharing on social media if you enjoy this, following the podcast, um, following my weekly email newsletter, uh, or even supporting on Patreon if you want to help keep this project going. On to the interview. Hi, I'm here with uh, Rebecca Willis. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks, it's great to be here. Um, So yeah, the the title of the book is Too Hot to Handle, The Democratic Challenge of Climate Change. Um, Part of what's implied here is that there is a challenge to democracy, um, or at least to democracy as it is typically practiced, that's posed by climate change. And as you bring up in the book, uh, there are people on, you know, from the center to the left who in different ways have kind of become skeptical of of democracy in response to climate change they would like to see either um uh technocrats or or experts in power or uh the the masses are holding us back um what are some of the challenges that climate change poses to democracy uh and and what are these skeptics trying to say yeah so I mean, I think it's absolutely right to question how democracies are functioning and whether they're in their current form, they're up to the job on climate. And, you know, because the facts are that no country, democratically governed or otherwise, yet has a national plan, a comprehensive plan to meet the targets that the world has agreed in the form of the you know the targets of the Paris Agreement, living uh, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, you know, quite a few countries, including the UK, have the target, but they do not have a, a comprehensive plan to meet it. So the evidence is there on the table. Democracies are failing on this. In fact, not just democracies; all all regimes are failing on this. Um, but that begs the question of whether, because democracy isn't working on this, whether you should chuck it out and start again, um, whether you should have some kind of autocratic or technocratic leadership instead, or whether you should actually reform democracies to make them work better for climate change. And I firmly believe that we need more democracy and better democracy to um to tackle the climate crisis and i'm sure we'll go on to talk about what you know what what form what what more and better democracy looks like but the the reason that i um reject the sort of anti-democracy arguments for climate are that you know climate isn't a scientific problem sure we need science to describe it and um we need scientific evidence to tell us what's going wrong but it's a it's a really social issue it's about how we live our lives how we run our economy where we get our energy from and we need people's input into that we can't solve the climate crisis without people noticing they're going to notice and in fact they've already noticed they're really worried about climate change and they want to know what can be done about it 
So I think what really needs to happen is to develop that kind of conversation between people and government about how we respond to the climate crisis. And I'm worried that in the, within the climate community, people don't oppose democracy outright, but there are kind of whisperings about, wouldn't it be better if the experts were in charge? You know, how can we make sure that scientists get to decide? That kind of thing. And I actually think that's really dangerous, that kind of implicit anti-democracy, because it's shutting people out when really the evidence shows that they want to be included in this conversation and that our responses would be better if they were. Mm -hmm. I, you made a really important point that people are going to notice uh, if we try to you know, dramatically transform the energy system and the economy and all these things that we would need to do to fight climate change. Um, it's not something that you could really effectively do under the radar. Um, but one of the things that you call out in the book is that uh, some politicians are, are trying to do some version of this. Uh, you call them uh, stealth strategies on climate change. Uh, what is what is a stealth strategy and why, you know, what's wrong with it? Yeah, so... <clears throat> I think a lot of climate action in the past sort of two or three decades has been stealth strategy because I think governments have been quite reluctant to talk to their citizens about what needs to happen um, in terms of, you know, changes to the way we live and changes to the economy and so on. And so they've gone for sort of technical approaches, things like decarbonizing the power sector switching to renewable energy or nuclear um uh, sort of industry you know reducing industrial use of energy that kind of thing the things that you can do that you can do sort of one step removed from people um but you know if you look at the changes ahead if you look at what needs to happen in terms of you know how we use the land what food we eat um, implications for transport, shift to electric vehicles and shift away from car use towards um, public transport. All those things are things that people are going to notice, right? And um, they're all to do with how our lives are shaped and how our, how our lives work. So stealth strategies worked to a certain extent over the past couple of decades. I think that over the past sort of 20 or 30 years there have been missed opportunities to actually set out a really positive vision because those stealth strategies have been available um, but even if we wanted to carry on down that path we couldn't now because um, the next stage of climate action is gonna mean changes to you know to, to, to what our, our world looks like not necessarily bad changes uh, some people won't like some of them. Um, some people will love them. Um, but we, whether we love them or hate them, we're going to notice them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other um, sort of flawed approach to, to climate policy making that you bring up that I think is really important is called the feel good fallacy. Um, so this is, this is maybe we say, Hey, we, we built this many solar panels, uh, without mentioning that the same company that built the solar panels is also burning lots of coal or something like that. Um, so what's what's the issue here with the feel-good fallacy? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's... my, my One of my favourite examples was um, a, a, an airport in Scotland um, who got a headline in the local paper um, saying... Um, airport in uh, global warming project success and this was because they had invited school children to plant trees um, <laughs> all around the new terminal building <laughs> and you know it had worked because there was you know pictures of smiling kids and trees being planted and not a mention in the article about the fact that this was to allow an airport expansion to allow expansion of one of our highest carbon industries right so i mean that is the feel good factor um being used at its most cynical but it's not just kind of deliberate cynical misuse it's it's something that i think is 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 more widespread it is focusing on you know the incredible growth in renewable energy i mean it's amazing to see how much 
uh, how much renewable energy has expanded, how much it's come down in price. That's a huge success story, both for wind and, and solar, for example. Um, but the fact is that we're still using more oil than we ever did before. Mm-hmm. And the, um, you know, you could argue that, that renewables expansion is, is um, making a dent in the rate of increase of oil use. But that's not enough, is it? <laughs> you know, we need to be um, we need to be transitioning away from fossil fuels altogether. And it's so much easier to just to talk about the good stuff, uh, the feel good stuff, than it is to actually confront the bad stuff. Like, how are we going to stop digging fossil fuels out of the ground and burning them? How are we going to tackle um, the huge Im- um emissions burden from uh from car use uh from aviation and um we need to face these things head on and even you know even climate campaigners sometimes find or or environmental groups sometimes find this difficult because you know it's not necessarily a good news story it requires sort of quite difficult conversations but unless we tackle the bad as, as, as unless we do less of the bad as well as more of the good we're not gonna we're not gonna get there exactly um, not only are elected officials not having these open conversations with the public, it seems like they aren't necessarily having them with each other. Um, you interviewed a lot of UK members of parliament um, and paint kind of a, a stark picture of, of life inside the halls of power. Um, people who who brought up climate change regularly uh, were said that they felt like their colleagues considered them freaks or zealots or part of a lunatic fringe uh, you know, oh, here he goes again. Roll, roll, they'd roll their eyes if someone, you know, if Steve over there brought up climate change again. Yeah. Um, and so, what did you, what did you learn from these interviews? So, I think what I learned by you know having very open and anonymous conversations with politicians about climate is that it's not enough just to give them the facts and expect them to act. Um, is they really need the facts? They need good education, um, but it's it it's not enough on its own. And I was the reason I did this research is because I was previously part of a project where we did actually provide MPs with um, evidence on climate. So we sat them down with scientists and policy experts, and 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 you know gave them all the information. And I think we sort of hoped that if they had a really full picture, they would sort of, you know, trot back into the Houses of Parliament and change everything. (laughs) And that didn't happen. And it just really made me start to think, well, why, you know, why aren't they uh, taking action? If they know the climate crisis is a crisis, if they know how serious it is, why are they not doing anything? And a couple of things that that they told me, which I found really interesting, that, that the first one is, as 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 you alluded to, how important this question of their own sort of identity as a politician is um, that you know they want to be a politician that's that's credible, that's taken seriously, that um, you know manages to get good good jobs, good positions within parliament or government, and they worry that if they speak out on climate or not just climate, you know there are other issues. If they're sort of too Uh, too shrill, too loud, too campaigny, then um, their colleagues won't respect them and support them. And we all know that, right, from workplace settings, we all know that that, that, that we worry about whether we, you know, whether we're speaking out too much, whether we're making, you know, whether we're being, whether we're making life awkward for other people. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that politicians feel that as well. And climate is not or was not at the time I was doing those interviews in the sort of between 2016 and 2019. It wasn't at that time enough of a mainstream issue for politicians to feel really comfortable about it. So it's that whole identity question. And then the other one, which, you know, we might want to explore a bit more is, is um, that politicians were not convinced that they had um, public support for action on climate. They were worried that um, they would get punished by their electorate for supporting it. And on that second point, I think that in the UK anyway, and obviously, you know, things are a bit different as we know in the US, but in the UK, 
politicians were routinely underestimating levels of public concern about climate and public support for action on climate. Mm -hmm. I think this is a a good moment to pivot to, okay, if, if we've established that democracies as they currently exist aren't responding to this well, um, and we've decided that more democracy is a preferable solution to autocracy, um, what what could that look like? And, and maybe just start by, um, specifically, you're interested in deliberative democracy. Um, what, what does that even mean? Sure. Well, deliberative democracy is... Um, I mean, it has a very long sort of theoretical tradition, but the way you can think about it is as a sort of enhanced conversation between citizens and the state. So, you know, back in the very earliest days of democracy in ancient Greece, for example, we had direct democracy, which is where people literally came to the town square and put their hand up to vote on different things. I say people, uh, you were only a citizen if you were a man and not a slave. So, you know, their system wasn't perfect. Um, but that whole idea was that you could, you could turn up and make your views known by raising your hand, by debating it, um, uh, 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 amongst each other as citizens. Now, obviously, you know, you could do that in ancient Greece. Um, it's very hard to do with, you know, uh, 70 million people as we have in the UK or you know several hundred million as you have in the US um but we've gone much too much to the other extreme we've got this very hollowed out conception of democracy now which is basically like you know uh have a vote once every four or five years and then let the politicians handle it and the mechanisms by which politicians talk to their electorate talk to citizens have really been eroded. So deliberative democracy is saying, look, there are conditions that are necessary for democracy to work properly, which is much more than, you know, getting elections right and letting people vote. Um, voting is necessary, but su- but not sufficient. That we need to create those conditions under which um, citizens can can learn, can think, can um, talk to each other, can talk to experts and politicians and can come to a a collective view. And that that sounds sort of hopelessly idealistic. But uh, what I mean, how I think of it is that we need to go back to the very idea of, you know, why we have a state, right? Why, (laughs) why, why we put some people in charge. And We do that because we, as individuals, know that we can't solve everything ourselves, right? We, we need a state, whether that be to, you know, for, for, for defense or to lay down, you know, basic sort of safety standards, or there are all kinds of ways in which it makes sense for us as individuals to sacrifice some of our liberty to put the state in place to do things collectively that we can't do individually. And that is the social contract. That's like the fundamental idea of of, of politics. And what I think deliberative democracy is about and what I think is needed now for the climate crisis is a renegotiation of that social contract to have a really explicit um, and deliberate and exploratory conversation between citizens and the state on on climate change and that sounds very theoretical but there are ways of actually doing that in practice that I've had experience with. Yeah maybe uh, we can talk about what a citizens climate assembly looks like in practice. Yeah so the the climate so I was involved in Climate Assembly UK which was run by the UK Parliament and the point of this was to get citizens views on um, how the UK should meet its climate target so we got it wasn't just like people who wanted to come we selected just over 100 people who were representative of the UK as a whole so you know they were um, it was like the, the the country in miniature in terms of gender age ethnicity where they lived in the country um their uh, sort of socioeconomic status um the uh d- 
disability, that kind of thing. So we had this the country in miniature and then we spent four weekends with them talking through, giving them access to information and expertise and, 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 and talking through what they wanted the government to do on climate. So it was that social contract conversation. It was like, okay, I as an individual would like you, the government, to do these things on our behalf. And in return, I as an individual will do that thing. So, you know, very practically, I would drive less if there was really good uh, public transport in my area. I would like public money to be spent on better public transport, which would mean that I would have a choice about whether or not to drive my car to work. Under those conditions, you know, I, I might not might not drive my car so much or I might not even have a car anymore. So that's a very sort of practical example of how that conversation works. And what we found by doing Climate Assembly UK, and this has been repeated a lot of times in a lot of different countries, including France, uh, Denmark, um, and lots of different cities uh, within the UK and elsewhere. And I think every single time it's happened, the people involved have come up with a really sensible and ambitious set of climate actions. Um, and they've they've you know come to a conclusion on that they you know they there are difficult things there are things that people always find difficult generally speaking people are um in in the uk anyway and i think there's research similar in the us that um people don't like uh restricting um flying they are worried about uh about changes to diet but there's a whole load of other stuff that they really want government to get on with and do Mm-hmm. What are what are some surprising examples of of policies that were endorsed by by groups like this that maybe on the surface you would have thought that they would have been more afraid of or it would have seemed like too much of a sacrifice or something? Yeah, so um restricting car use was an interesting one. So people didn't want um people were quite cautious about restricting car use, but they were very happy with things like banning cars from city centres and having a, a lot more investment in in uh, public transport and walking and cycling. And they were definitely much bolder on that than politicians would be. Um, there was a lot of support which um, came out across all the areas we looked at for more localised approaches. So in the UK, we have a very centralised political system um local government has very little power and resources and they thought that should change they liked the idea of um you know local government um having more control over um energy strategy things like you know where we how, how we develop renewable energy um strategies to improve the building stock to um, you know, to make sure it's better insulated. So they want a, they wanted a more localised approach. And even on some of the areas that we know are tricky, like flying and like diet, people were willing to compromise. So on flying, people supported the idea of um, taxing, like people getting one tax-free flight a year and then um, having to pay increasing amounts of tax for every flight after that, the frequent flyer levy. And they sort of accepted that, you know, that might have to be done. And they were they were supportive of that. And on on um, on diet, um, that is kind of a culture point, like, you know, no, everyone's very resistant to being told to be vegan. (laughs) But if you if 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 when you ask people, you know, would you eat less meat? Um, You know, would you look at alternatives to meat? They're quite happy to consider that. And you know, to I think they ended up agreeing on 20% reduction in meat and dairy consumption. So, you know, they were, they were up for change. Mm-hmm. So one follow-up question is, great, we have these assemblies, people come up with exciting ideas. Um, do they actually necessarily make a difference? Um, so in France, for instance, uh, uh, President Emmanuel Macron uh, pull together this similar climate assembly that um, came up with a lot of proposals that were supposed to go through to the general public through a ballot measure, um, but Macron just kind of blocked a few of them right at the outset uh, because he thought they they went too far. 
um, before, you know, so we didn't let those go before the public. So what, how can we make sure, I guess, that these, these assemblies actually then have an impact in, in the real world? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, it, it, it's, it's a really important question. And, you know, if, if the citizens in a, in a climate assembly or something come up with a really good set of policies, there are still reasons why those policies haven't been implemented yet, right? Because they're, you know, might be expensive or politically difficult, or maybe there are, you know, strong commercial interests lobbying against them. And so you can come up with a perfect set of recommendations and then throw them back into the real world of politics and they haven't solved anything. Um, I think that the danger is that these processes become discredited um, if the if the um, recommendations aren't taken up. And certainly in the UK, um, the UK was a bit of a strange one because the, the assembly was run by parliament. Um, but we, you know, it's actually only the, the ruling party, the government who can take up the recommendations and, and actually change the law. So um, we haven't seen a huge amount of, 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 of uptake of the recommendations. We've seen it have influence in a lot of other ways, but we didn't see the prime minister saying, OK, I'm going to do these three things because the climate assembly told me to. We haven't seen that at all. So that is really a problem. Um, what I would say about that is... Um, it shouldn't deter a government who, you know, really wants to use these processes. And, you know, we've seen in Scotland, actually, Scotland had a climate assembly and it was much closer to government. And there's been quite a lengthy dialogue between citizens and the government about what they're going to implement and how they're going to take forward the recommendations. So I think that's a good example. But also it's about not putting all the emphasis on climate assemblies, these kind of big bang, um, you know, one off events and just looking at how you can do citizen deliberation in, um, in, in, in all kinds of ways. So we're working now, uh, my research team at, at Lancaster University is working with the Climate Change Committee, who are um, independent advisors on climate, to get um, some citizen deliberation going about what needs to change in the home to reduce energy use in the home, which is obviously very topical now, given, given energy prices and, and what's happening with gas. Um, so we're working with a small group, like 25 citizens, to, to, to help them develop their advice to government. That's one thing that can be done. I think, um, you know, the, James Fishkin, who's a very um, influential deliberative uh, democracy advocate in the US, he, um, I, I think it was him, suggested this idea that, that politicians in the US should just, like, spend time on the phone like on a video call with with um uh, with uh, citizens with their electorate and uh, i think someone did the maths about how you know if they talk to 20 citizens a week then during their term of office they'd get to talk to you know a, a decent chunk of the electorate and just hear from them about their uh, hopes and fears and their everyday life and everything and just you know a lot more structure put in place to allow politicians to talk to citizens, not just about climate, but, you know, I think it's particularly needed on climate. Mm -hmm. Right. For instance, uh, Ireland overturning its abortion ban came out of uh, a citizens assembly there. Um, so I think that's evidence of if you bring people together and, and have them talk about an issue, they might come to conclusions that, a are, are beyond what maybe the politicians considered politically acceptable, and B can actually um, come to fruition. Uh, but the idea of talking with uh, people on smaller scales than these big one-off assemblies is also really important, partly because uh, not only for its impact on politicians, but its impacts on everyday people um, themselves or ourselves. Uh, one of the things you know is that, yes, while people want more action on climate change, most people aren't necessarily putting it toward the top of their day-to-day -day list of things that need to change. Um, and I think in some ways that's for understandable reasons of there are often more urgent, um, you know, economic or health or, or other uh, concerns, um, but also because sometimes we we live in like this dual reality where even those of us who 
who are climate activists or who care about a lot of this issue where, um, you know, yes, on the one hand, you're aware that the world's ecosystems and climate are in this catastrophic uh, disruption. And on the other hand, you like just have to live your day to day life um, and that it's that it can be really hard to to live in this this dual reality um but that once people have gone through a deliberative democratic process an assembly or what have you um they actually care more about climate change than than they did when when they start um can you talk a bit about both both this idea of like why it's so hard for the urgency of climate change to sink in even if we give it lip service and and how more uh forums for deliberative democracy might might help with that yeah so i mean you're right that you know the reason it's it's hard to incorporate climate into our lives is partly that you know we all have a lot going on in our lives and climate isn't um for a lot of people a lot of the time it doesn't seem as um to be hitting you in the face the same way that daily life does um, of course, that's not true if you are a pastoralist where the rains have failed or if you've been the victim of a of a flood or, a, um, you know, a, a, a climate induced landslide or something. So, right. you know, climate change is unfortunately hitting a lot more people in the face a lot more of the time. But if you have the luxury of not suffering direct climate impacts, you can park it to one side and then you're right that just the enormity of it and thinking about um you know the what what a a a 3 or 4 degree world would be like it's 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 terrifying and exhausting and you know when i when i go on holiday um when when i'm away from work because i work on climate change every day it's like this kind of psychic burden and you know when I'm away I was on a holiday last week and it was just so nice not to think about it and you know you need to switch off you need to get that distance otherwise it would be quite all-consuming so there's there's a lot of reasons and there's a lot of really good psychology and sociology on this there's a lot of reasons why we don't uh you know take climate change seriously all of the time but I think we need to fight that to a certain extent. And and I, I'm, I think climate assemblies are part of the issue. I mean, certainly one of the great things about them is that people who have um, taken part in a climate assembly are trusted by other people to be sort of messengers on climate. So you're likely to trust someone like you that has been part of that process more than you might trust a, a, an expert, or at least, you know, as much as you would trust an expert. And you... You know, just the same way that we like getting information from friends and family um, from within within our filter bubble, if you like, then, you know, the people who've been involved in climate assemblies can be really useful. But I think there's a wider thing about just, you know, literally talking about climate more, making it more part of our day to day lives, not contributing to this kind of societal denial that we have around us. Um, and sometimes that's really difficult. You know, I... I um I'm always I'm always wanting to if I hear someone's just you know I don't know taking a flight for a weekend away or something part of me wants to say oh did you think about climate when you made that decision to you know fly for a two-day weekend in Barcelona or something or you know was that mm. not a factor for you but I never ask because I'm too <laughs> polite right um but I mean, the question's always there for me, right? And in a way, that's exactly the conversation we, to, we need to be having. Like, oh, did you think about getting the train? Did you think about going somewhere more local? <laughs> um, do you, you know, and, and, and even more basically, like, do you worry about climate change? Do you worry about what your future what is going to be like, what your kids' future will be like? And, you know, not in a kind of, just out in a spirit of curiosity, not in a spirit of, um, of, of, of attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the more helpful recommendations in your book is just don't be afraid to talk about it more, um, you know, both about those individual things we do and and like what what can your work, you know, talk about it with your colleagues about what your workplace can do yeah. or or with your elected official. Um, and 
yeah i i i just went to detroit for a couple weeks from california and i i flew back but i I took a train there but i i almost like and i i've started doing this before i was in chicago and my family's in california and i take these you know 48 hour train or bus rides and i i'm almost like a little embarrassed to bring them up or i try to avoid it sometimes because people just look at me like i'm crazy um and and i also like don't want to be like well it's because the way that you travel is bad for the earth um but yeah i know there there are ways to have those conversations that actually are productive um and and you know i don't necessarily know that long term like maybe there are better solutions than 48 hour bus rides Mm -hmm. but um it's something i can do anyway so i i I want to ask a little more about your um your personal story here too which is interesting uh where you you worked with this organization green alliance um that worked you you kind of say more on the inside of the political system more directly with politicians and and accomplished a lot of good through this um but kind of looking looking back on it now uh you you aren't sure that maybe there could have been more of a balance between inside and and outside working with with non-politicians can you talk a little of how you how you reflect on that experience now or, or how you came to that conclusion yeah i mean funnily enough so someone i spoke to earlier today said what uh message would you have for your younger self and you know that kind of question inspires absolute terror in me <laughs> um uh, partly because I don't get, I, I don't buy into this idea that, you know, we're all so much wiser when we're older. I think young people have an incredible amount of wisdom. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to sort of pretend like uh, I have all the answers just because I'm a bit older. Um, but my message to my younger self would be um, don't try and be nice to everyone. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know don't compromise all the time and i mean we shouldn't have compromised on climate back then we certainly shouldn't compromise and be nice now you know when you have the world's leading scientists um when you have the international energy agency saying that um we can't uh open any new oil wells or coal mines um you've got to be direct about that you've got to face up to that truth and that might mean telling someone who works for bp that they shouldn't be working for that company or that that company should be doing different things and you know we should you know we we need to be a lot more honest and confident about um what we think but the 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 difficulty is that if you're a campaigner, if it's your job just to say, you know, to have a very black and white message about what's needed, then that's no problem, right? You can just say, you know, you can just lock yourself to a pipeline and say this pipeline should not be here. Mm-hmm. It's more complicated if you're talking to the authorities about, um, you know, how they could um develop their energy strategy so they don't need that pipeline anymore um it's more complicated still if you involve the companies that are laying that pipeline in the discussion about the future so the science hasn't changed right you still need to stop digging up and sending that that oil through pipelines but the way that you achieve change um is different from campaigning because it is about listening to um you know listening to where governments are listening to what solutions there might be and working through that so um it it, it's very difficult to be sort of steadfastly confident and and clear about the big changes that need to happen while at the same time being sort of realistic and um and useful having realistic and useful conversations with people about how that change happens yeah i i'm not sure myself how to walk that line and so one only only a couple more questions but one thing i wanted to ask about is um you know the the too hot to handle book came out in 2020 obviously a lot has happened in the world since then um and yep. the coronavirus uh is 
among other things, um, the coronavirus is an example of a a something that is both scientific and technical as an issue, but also very social. And I think regardless of whatever the, the right way to handle it was, which I don't think most countries, at least the United States, certainly didn't do the right way, uh, but certainly inspired a lot of a backlash against whatever you know public health um initiatives were were put in place um and also you know in the last couple of years there's been and i'm i'm more familiar with the u.s context a uh, kind of a frustrating governmental impasse on climate change to put it mildly um where it looked like there was going to be at least some climate bill passed uh, under the Biden administration that has now just been languishing for, I don't know, almost a year. Um, so yeah, how, um, how have these last two years impacted just how you, how you view the relationship between, um, like technical expertise, government and the people? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a huge question, isn't it? I mean, the biggest problem with COVID, with the pandemic, and now with the war in Ukraine, is it's just a thief of attention away from climate. Which is not to say we shouldn't have focused on climate and that we shouldn't focus on the war. But, you know, there's only so much uh, political attention and public attention you know, we can only worry about so much at once. And the danger is that, you know, climate isn't going away, but you might, you'd have been forgiven for thinking so if you look at the headlines and if you look at political speeches mm -hmm. over the past couple of years. And that's really problematic because these are the years that we really need to get stuff done. So that worries me. Um, I think that we maybe had a little, I mean, for for you guys over in the US, COVID just happened in this absolute toxic mess of your politics, didn't it? It was much more <laughs> problematic. Whereas I think here, it in some ways it gave me in in some ways it gave me a bit of optimism because um, you know it was a crisis. We needed scientists to help us understand that crisis. The scientists were given you know a decent amount of respect by politicians to navigate their way through there was a little bit too much of the politicians going oh leave it to the science you know like science can make decisions for you when it obviously mm -hmm. can't um but there was uh you know a decent process by which scientific evidence was sort of was used by politicians quite effectively i thought and the reason that it worked better for covid than it does for climate is because you know there was no there was no way around those decisions. You know, decisions had to be made. Decisions about lockdown, decisions about um, economic support and so on absolutely had to be made. Um, and, and, and you know, a day's delay made a difference. And for climate, it's urgent and serious, but a day's delay does not make a difference. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, makes such a small fraction of a difference that you don't notice. So it's a different type of urgent. Um, but it did show, I think, that we can mobilise, that we can do, um, you know, pretty far reaching things with our politics, that it doesn't break when we do. Um, and, you know, at one point there was, um, you know, we had, uh, I can't remember the numbers, millions of people here being paid furlough payments by the state, um, you know, because and, and, and they managed to avoid economic collapse. I mean, it was quite remarkable mm. that they did all that. And so in some ways it gives me hope for, you know, going back to this point of of of, of why we need the state, what the social contract is for. It's like, you know, the, the COVID pandemic showed absolutely how we need to take collective decisions about something like that and how you can't go it alone as an individual. So that, that actually gave me some some sort of uh some optimism for 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 climate. But the the um the real problem is not seeing the linkages so you know economic recovery from covid should have been tied to climate objectives it hasn't been mm. um you know the um 
even with the Ukraine situation, um, you know, a lot of that has come about because, um, you know, Russia has funded its army through fossil fuel export so again there are some obvious linkages and politicians aren't picking these up and they really need to because the climate crisis there's nothing that isn't linked to the climate crisis right we need to be whenever we're solving any other whenever whenever we're trying to solve any other problem in government we've got to be linking it to the climate crisis Mm -hmm. so i know you have to go soon um so just kind of one more question um you know let's say i'm i'm sold that we need more uh, robust public conversations about climate change and, you know, contributions to what solutions should look like from everyday people. And we need avenues and pathways for uh, politicians to <laughs> hear those conversations, be part of those conversations and uh, respond to those conversations. Um, how can we start making that happen or or what are the what are the prospects for for increasing deliberative democracy moving forward specifically around climate issues well i mean i you know i can't i i, I don't want to guess what the prospects are <laughs> i can say what i want to happen but all i can say is that these things are needed for the sake of democracy as well as for the sake of climate Right. That, you know, Mm. the sort of lurch towards populism has come about because we've had political elites who haven't taken people's grievances seriously. This is why, you know, this is why populists get the power they do, because we've had politicians that have taken the electorate for granted. We've had politicians who haven't really, um, you know, who've listened more to to um to big corporations than they have to people um we've seen um you know a a real erosion of trust in politicians um and deliberative democracy sort of building that social contract is a way to renew democracy as, as as well as a way to tackle climate change so um you know and 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 i I do I'm really heartened to see the all the different experiments that have happened you mentioned Ireland that's a really good example of of you know where deliberative democracy has made a real difference to some questions that had that had um stalled in um Irish politics and Irish society for a really long time you know not just abortion but equal marriage as well um two things that politicians were terrified of even opening their mouths on have now you know reached some kind of um consensual position which is incredible um you know there was there was uh actually ironically a a, a, a citizens assembly done about Brexit um after the referendum vote. But if we'd had a citizens' assembly on Brexit rather than the referendum, that might have actually helped to heal our politics. So, you know, I, I, I think you can, if you look around, you can see examples of where these processes are being used really effectively um, to uh, to get, you know, to, and, and to strengthen democracy as well as to tackle those specific issues. So, you know, I think there is, I do see that possibility and I do see politicians who really want to champion it. So you know, it could happen. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, reading the book and having this conversation, it's also exciting. I I think uh, people maybe would enjoy and and feel fulfilled being more a part of the political process. And Oh, people love it. People absolutely love it. If you talk to people who've been given the chance to participate, they are, you know, uh, overwhelming, an overwhelming majority are so happy to be to have been given that responsibility and given the chance to have their voice heard. Well, thank you for uh, letting us hear your voice and coming on the show. Uh, and this was Rebecca Willis. Great. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. Thank you for listening. That was Rebecca Willis, author of Too Hot to Handle, The Democratic Challenge of Climate Change. I mentioned some long-distance bus and train trips that I've taken. Uh, I wrote about in Jacobin a few months back how what this experience was like and how it could be made better. Um, I, I put that article in the episode description below. If you like this podcast, 
please consider supporting it on Patreon. Um, and if you are interested in joining the Storytelling Animals Book Club, our next meeting will be April 26th to discuss the environmental classic Silent Spring, followed by May 31st to discuss the climate fantasy by N.K. Jemisin, the fifth season. To join either one of those, just sign up for my weekly email list, the weekly newsletter. Uh, the link is in the episode description. Um, to join both of them and all book club meetings moving forward, you can do so on my Patreon page. Thanks, have a good day. Thank you.